thank you. I think I'm definitely the odd woman in this session because I'm talking about optimizing cataract surgery in the abnormal uh, cornea. Since I've been told I have enough time, I will cover all these three categories. I was initially planning to stop with corneal ectasia. I think corneal ectasia, all of us deal, it's not only the cornea surgeon. So when a patient comes, I think the dilemma please is… Please correct the timer, please. No, no, please put it as uh, seven minutes. You want me to speak for 15 minutes? I can speak. Please always take more time to get ready. So <laughs> we'll have, we'll have so discussion I, I, for 15 minutes. I have enough content to speak for 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, the dilemma is whether you are doing only a cataract surgery, are you doing a combined cataract with corneal transplant? Or if you've done a corneal transplant first, then cataract surgery, what are the you know, dilemmas you deal with? So if you're doing cataract surgery alone, obviously it'll be an older patient where he's naturally become a non-progressive now. If the con it's a contact lens user who's happy with his, you know, ectatic cornea, doesn't want to do anything, or if the patient is unwilling for a keratoplasty. So how do you decide the IOL? Obviously you look at the topography, you look the, at the EKR report, if a, whether to you choose a toric or not, uh, choose a toric. If you see something like this, then maybe it's a good uh, case for toric, but if you're seeing uh, spikes like these, it's not a good case for toric. When do we do after cross-linking? If it's a younger patient, wait for at least six months because it takes six months for the corneal topography to stabilize. This was a young 16-year-old where we did uh, cross-linking first. Because she was a steroid user, she developed the cataract because of the allergic eye disease, stabilized the allergy and then planned the surgery six months after that. I think it, uh, it's going to be very similar to any regular toric IOL that you do. This case on the left hand side lower, I wanted to show that at the end of surgery, uh, I think it's coming out of my field. But I, the point I wanted to make here is that in these cases, sometimes the anterior chamber is also very deep. So if you over inflate at the end of surgery and it's a toric IOL, then the, definitely the IOL can rotate. That video, unfortunately, is not showing at all. So uh, when you're do already done a keratoplasty and then you're planning cataract surgery, then you have to wait for at least three months after all the sutures are out. So once you've done a keratoplasty, after one year, you'll start such suture removal, wait for three months, and then do a uh, cataract surgery. So this was a patient where you know, I, I looked at uh, putting in a toric IOL. We make sure you're protecting the endothelium use Tripe 1 Blue and Visco Good Visco Elastic. So these are patients where keratoplasty has already been done in patients with keratoconus, the younger patients. So here you're protecting the endothelium, your soft shell technique. When you're entering inside, make sure you're not entering on the graft hose junction and toric IOL gives very good results in these patients because your astigmatism is regular. Now this is another patient where you're planning keratoplasty first, then cataract uh, uh, surgery where, you know, getting good results. This was a patient who came uh, where, you know, one eye was done in more fields, that the other eye has very severe keratoconus. This patient had a hydrops in his graft. Now he was an older patient, but I still chose to do keratoplasty first because it was very difficult to choose an IOL par in this patient. Could not even use the other eye as a reference. So I counseled him, explained to him, did a keratoplasty, waited for a year, and then went ahead and did the cataract surgery. If you've done a DALC uh, first and, you know, again, it's pretty much the principles are similar, you'll do a DALC, get the sutures out, and at the end of that, you're going to go ahead and, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, you know, that uh, after around three months after removing all sutures, you're going to do the uh, cataract surgery. So in uh, combined cases, if you're going to combine a DALC, this is how it is uh, pretty much similar to doing any regular uh, the cataract surgery. If you're combining the DALC, now when are we combining either a DALC or a PK with cataract surgery? If the cataract is advanced, if you're unable to have two procedures, that's when you'll combine DALC. You can combine with cataract surgery or you can see once you've uh, dissected up to the mid stroma, you go ahead and do your cataract and then uh, pretty much, uh, you know, similar to doing a regular surgery. Now, when you're doing a combined uh, PK, what are the cons? Because if what is happening is if you do an open sky surgery, it's very difficult to get a rexis and in the back placement. So the way you do deal with that is this was a patient with advanced keratoconus and scarring. So what you can do is you can first go ahead with uh, doing the FACO surgery, go in with your intraocular lens implant, implant and then go ahead and refine uh, and then do a keratoplasty. So that way you're doing a closed chamber FACO and uh, you know you get a good uh, result, you're not opening the eye. So this is the uh, patient at the end doing well. Now again, this was a patient with a failed graft with cataract. 
likewise uh, you know if you're doing an open sky it's a big issue so what you can do is again do a partial thickness remove the uh, stroma do uh, the cataract surgery and then go ahead and remove the tissue and uh, you know do a full thickness graft it's always better than doing an open sky surgery uh, I think I have time, so, so I can now go ahead to the next topic, which is pterygium, which I thought will be relevant because all of us are placed with, uh, faced uh, with these questions, whether to do a pterygium first or to do a cataract first. I think uh, ideal, in ideal situations, it would always be better to do the pterygium first and then do a cataract surgery in all cases, but definitely more so if you're doing a toric IOL, if you're doing any uh, multifocal IOL, if it's a very large visual axis, uh, you know, pterygium covering the visual axis, if it's a recurrent pterygium, double-headed pterygium, if there's irregular astigmatism, uh, combined cases, maybe if the patient sometimes is logistically not willing to come back for uh, a second surgery or if it's a very small pterygium, then you can go ahead and do a combined uh, surgery. I'll just show all, start all the videos uh, together in the interest of time. So uh, you just go ahead with a regular uh, surgery. Once you've finished your uh, IOL, uh, you can go ahead and mark the pterygium, the autograft. When you're stripping the pterygium, you have to be careful. And also while cutting, I feel a tip is that at least in my hands, if I'm cutting it too much, like, you know, I feel I start with cutting it a little bit less and not too much because I feel I end up cutting a lot of tissue, which is sometimes not needed because anyway, the conjunctiva tracks so you cut it like you know you, if you feel you have not removed most of the tissue you can go back and cut it and then just peel it just like a rexis as you're seeing here and uh, so yeah that's my last slide and then you can use glue and uh, go ahead and put your uh, autograft I can stop thank you thank you so much <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much doctor Oh, gee. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The topic is all yours, sir, <laughs> Dr. Dityar. So, uh, are you, uh, supposing there is a early keratoconus, uh, would you prefer to do a, a regularization with a surface ablation and a cross-linking and then try to uh, go ahead and take a cataract surgery for that or would you uh, so I, I think just it do depends. a cross-linking? Yes, sir. So, uh, it depends on the age of the patient. If the patient is an older patient, it's a non-progressive keratoconus, then I really don't think I would go, I would touch the cornea. I would straight away go ahead and just put in a toric IOL and uh, address just the cataract. But if it's a younger patient, it is a progressive uh, keratoconus and I feel that we can go ahead and address the cornea. That's when I would probably do, I haven't done it in any older patients as such. I haven't done the cornea and the no, cataract. Uh, that's a, a separate point that you have raised regarding the age and the progression. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, a toric IOL versus a surface regularization with a topo guided uh, would you prefer uh, that because even if it is not progressing uh, maybe an older patient in the, those circumstances the quality of vision with a toric lens may not be as good as uh, you are doing a symmetrization of the cornea using a topo guided yes sir, definitely so if the cornea is irregular the patient has ghost symptoms like you know symptoms where he has ghosting of vision and a lot of older patients also do come with those symptoms where only with the rgp lens they feel their quality vision is good i think that's a very valid point in such a patient we should go ahead with regularizing the cornea and then preferably put in a to non toric just a monofocal iol or, or a toric uh, if there's a regular astigmatism remaining so i After think the region sorry I think as a general principle in most of the abnormal corneas, it may be a better idea to avoid toric lenses in the first place unless you are absolutely sure of the, yeah. the access of the astigmatism. And then uh, maybe like Sir said, uh, it might be preferable to do a pre-cataract uh, surface smoothening procedure as compared to a toric lens. Correct. I think the EKR will definitely give us an idea as to whether toric is indicated on this patient. Or so after pterygium surgery, still there is some scar on the periphery and your K1, K2 shows some changes and all. When do you decide monofocal is best? Monofocal. monofocal. Uh, so not you the mean monofocal toric or uh, in monofocal. any of it? Uh, not the toric, I mean the only monofocal. Not only the monofocal. I think at three months, if you uh, feel that the astigmatism is stable and the scar if scarring is anyways going to be peripheral, if the astigmatism is stable, I think we can, if it's needed, stable and uh, regular, I think there's no harm in going ahead with a toric if it's needed. 
minimum three months in an ideal scenario. And uh, would it be a good idea to do a RGP over refraction preoperatively? So, in which case, sir? In most of the abnormal corneas. Before you take them up for surgery, put an RGP lens and see how much of uh, I think the, uh, that's a very good point. Maybe like, in, like even like Dr. Mahipal said, in like in patients with keratoconus who are having these ghosting symptoms, like you know they are not comfortable, they have the uh, glare issues. And I feel in them that would be a good idea to do RGP and see if those symptoms are getting relieved. Then to see if a cornea-based surgery is going to help them, for sure. Oh, I, I think your point is uh, valid. You know. But if you have an advanced cataract, then it may not be really feasible. You can't really do anything through that. Other important thing would be these cases, they assess maybe on a contact lens for a quite a number of uh, years sometimes. Yeah. So you have, there will be a war phase happening in these cases. So you have to give time for a cornea to recover also. So if there are RGP lenses, maybe a four to six weeks off contact lens, reassess the cornea subsequently, then uh, plan it accordingly. Yes, and as far as, uh, uh, Whenever we talk about uh, pterygium surgery, anything, as she is asking, how much time we should wait? Three months may be ideal, but it, it is the stability of your corneal parameters. Correct. The time you think your corneal parameters are stable, stable. so yes. when you do a keratometry within a one or two weeks different, they are similar, then that's the time you can take patient for surgery. Uh, before that, you make sure your ocular surface is okay, because after this surgery, ocular surface may not be proper, there may be still a lot of conjunctival staining, corneal staining may be there, uh, but there may be some opacities underneath that which is getting fibrous. So you have to get enough time. Sometimes you may have to do a you know, uh, sort of a PTK type or a uh, ablation to smoothen the cornea before you think of any procedure. Right. So stability of corneal parameter, both in terms of surface wise and the uh, power wise has to be checked for both keratoconus as well for the pterygium surgeries. Yes, sir. See, uh, my normal dictum is that if a patient is, as he said, already wearing a contact lens under those circumstances, I won't, uh, that means that the amount of ectasia is pretty high, hmm. uh, not going to be amenable to topo guided, not going to be amenable to, as he said, a good toric lens. Uh, under those circumstances, That's I'll go ahead and do a monofocal and again rehabilitate the patient post-operatively with a uh, contact lens, RGP or mini scleral or whatever. Yes. So that's uh, what it is. Yes, I think, sir. are there any other questions on this uh, irregular cornea, this particular topic? In fact, okay. the older patients, they prefer that, sir. They say we want to go back to our lens. If yeah, yeah those who are used to it, I yes. think we'll have yeah. better not to mess with them. Thank you, sir. That's what I said. See, the point is that under those circumstances, if you do a surface symmetrization with a cross-linking, that should be done before. And then you calculate the lens power and then accordingly do that. Right. You can do it later also, that's Thank not you, a sir. problem, but then your lens power and all will change. So you're just doing a topo-guided symmetrization. Do that and then go ahead and uh, look at that. Anyway,